Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> and um, thank you for the introduction to come and talk today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And it's um, been an amazing morning already. I uh, had a serious case of imposter syndrome already. So we'll keep that going. Um, so today, as Amy said, I'm going to be talking about our work on Lyme disease. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a bit more of a uh, introduction into the devices and the technologies that we use for looking at host pathogen interactions in infection and inflammation. Uh, and then I'll talk more specifically about this small project uh, in the lab. Uh, so the lab works mostly on uh, innate immune cells, uh, namely uh, neutrophils and monocytes. And we use uh, a lot of different models to answer different questions, depending on what's most appropriate. So there's a big focus on in vitro models. Uh, we developed new microfluidic devices, uh, which we'll be seeing a lot of today. And we use these devices to do a lot of ex vivo clinical testing. So most of it is on blood. We get from various patient populations and we run in our microfluidic assays to kind of profile uh, leukocyte uh, function in these patient cohorts. Uh, now, my background is also in in vivo modeling, so I uh, bring to the table some uh, ability to translate these in vitro findings uh, into uh, an in vivo setting. So this is a bit of a background. Um, uh, my PhD was on zebrafish, and this is the zebrafish inflammatory model where we've snipped the tail uh, off the end of the zebrafish larva, and we can look at host leukocytes you have neutrophils in green and macrophages in red migrate into this site of damage and they line up here along along the wound and obviously their role is to um, mostly for the neutrophils is to attack any potential invading microbes uh, and then the macrophages also play a big role in the regeneration of this tail tip um, and we've looked in this model uh, at a lot of inflammatory uh, processes including reverse migration of these neutrophils away from the wound site and how this could contribute to um, secondary inflammation and also the interactions between these cell types in the context of infection, including shuttling of um, pathogens between these two cell types and how that might influence infection outcome. Uh, since 2015, I've been working with Daniel Arimia at, um, at Mass General Hospital, uh, developing uh, new um, microfluidic assays to look at uh, neutrophil behavior from a drop of blood. And this is an example of an assay that we de developed a couple of years ago to look at spontaneous neutrophil migration uh, in sepsis patients. So this device takes a single drop of blood about uh, two microliters into the center, and then we can watch the activated neutrophils migrate out into these, um, uh, these mazes all by themselves. And we can track them and do complicated analyses to identify specific behaviors and uh, using this model, we were able to, um, to predict sepsis in a cohort of uh, ICU patients. Um, you know, my background is mostly in host pathogen interactions directly, uh, and specifically fungal infections. So we've developed models to look at neutrophil interactions with uh, fungal hyphae uh, in the Saspidilis fumigatus model. We, were, we identified a unique branching uh, stimulation that occurs with an interaction with neutrophils. And we were able to show that this uh, branching could also be stimulated by uh, physical interactions, which was um, interesting and also quite useful because it allowed us to compare uh, how neutrophils responded to, um, to hyphae after varying stages of branching. And we were able to show that they destroyed the thinner branches that had branched more often, much more quickly than the thicker branches. Um, but when we looked at a patient cohort of at-risk patients uh, following burn injury, uh, we showed that they weren't able to destroy the thin branches very well at all, um, which suggested this induction of branching might actually be bad uh, for their infections. Uh, and this uh, device has also been useful for other uh, collaborators looking at uh, the mechanisms of fungal hyphal branching. Um, we have had some projects that have kind of integrated all three aspects of our lab uh, approaches, uh, looking at in vivo, in vitro, and using patient samples. And this is an example where we were looking at a, um, a new approach to uh, creating antibiotics 
or antifungals in this case, where you have a bifunctional uh, drug, which has a targeting moiety at one end and an effector moiety at the other end. And the targeting moiety um, binds to the target, the fungus in this case, and the effector moiety aims to amplify the uh, host response against the fungus. And we were able to show very nicely that this worked uh, well in our um, microfluidic models of fungal infection. And we also translated this into um, the zebrafish model where we had to actually express the human formal peptide receptor to get this drug to work, which showed its real specificity for this uh, receptor ligand interaction. We were also able to show that this, uh, this drug was able to restore um, antifungal activity of neutrophils from, from at-risk patients. Um, as well as fungal interactions, we're also developed tools to look at bacterial interactions as an example of neutrophils here in blue in a microfluidic assay uh, attacking uh, Staphylococcus aureus and expressing GFP here in these microfluidic chambers. And you can see an example where, um, you know, there aren't enough neutrophils coming in to suppress the growth of the bacteria compared to one where you have a uh, strong neutrophil response and the bacterial growth is able to be suppressed. And we've used this model to look at a few different things, including whether stimulation of the neutrophil response, uh, you know, helps against bacterial infection, which of course it does. Uh, and also the effect of various antibiotics on neutrophil uh, functionality. So, you know, there's a theory that when you have an antibiotic resistant bacterium, um, if you're using a, an antibiotic that might actually affect host function, you might end up with a worse outcome. Um, and we we're able to show that there's a number of antibiotics that have this effect with uh, neutrophils. Uh, more recently, I've been looking at the um, ability of host cells to disseminate infection. And this is similar to what Mike was talking about earlier with this um, Trojan horse type uh, 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 situation where a host cell can carry a, um, a bacteria or a virus uh, into a place where it wouldn't usually be able to go. We have a couple of different models of this. Uh, this is just an example of a bacteria labeled with a green or lexa floor. It's also co-labeled with a pH rhodo, which turns red when it's acidified within the neutrophil. And you'll see a neutrophil come in, find the bacteria, phagocytose it and acidify it, and then it maintains its migration uh, post uh, phagocytosis and carries the bacterium away. Um, so we've looked at a few different contexts. Uh, for this assay, and we found that in particular bacteria that are able to suppress host ROS uh, avoid being killed by the uh, host cell, uh, as well as by suppressing the host ROS, it maintains the motility of the host cell, allowing the host cell to carry the bacteria uh, over la large distances. And we've also begun developing a, um, a zebrafish model of dissemination by uh, host leukocytes. Uh, in this case, we're looking actually at a um, a uh, bacteria from the mouth, which I think will be touched on in one of the later talks. And we have a uh, in injection into the otic vesicle, which is the uh, developing ear of the zebrafish. Uh, and you can see uh, inflammation around this point where you see neutrophils and macrophages are also coming in. Um, but then the neutrophils are carrying away these bacteria. Uh, and if you take away the innate immune cells, this ba um, bacterial infection doesn't spread. And this is something, yeah, as I said, we're talking, looking at in context of uh, oral infections and how they might spread uh, throughout the body. Now, today I'll be talking about uh, Lyme disease. And I just want to point out the main two uh, players in this story. Uh, one is Sinan Mulder, who is a um, French Turkish postdoc in the lab who has since uh, moved back to Turkey and taken on a role uh, in a, a biotech company there looking at. Um, identifying circulating nets in the blood. And Anika Morand, who you can see here, uh, exhausted after a long day of uh, data analysis. Uh, and she has since started a uh, PhD uh, at Northwestern University. And this lab was done, uh, this work was done in the lab of Daniel Arimia in collaboration with uh, Clement Strell, John Brander, Adam Rath, and Charles and Jacob, and was recently published. So you can look up a lot of this work um, if you need to. So this project came about, um, funnily enough, uh, during our work on the sepsis patients. And we were measuring neutrophil migration, uh, spontaneous neutrophil migration from a whole bunch of different patient subsets as well as healthy controls. 
And uh, funnily enough, one of our healthy controls um, was Anika. And at some point during this project, we started to see some very interesting uh, neutrophil migration signatures from Anika. Um, so here we're using a neutr spontaneous neutrophil migration score, which takes into account the number of migrating neutrophils, uh, as well as um, their behaviors. And what we saw was that her uh, spontaneous neutrophil migration score started to jump around. And it turned out that she'd been on holiday up in Maine at her sister's place and been bitten by a tick and contracted uh, Lyme disease. Um, so I'm sure most of you might be familiar with Lyme disease, but it's uh, something that's endemic to this region uh, in, the, in the Northeast. Uh, however, it's getting wi more widely and widely spread. So uh, between 93 and 2012, the distribution is, is quadrupled and it's been noted in all 50 states now. Um, there's uh, around 30,000 cases reported annually, I believe, but the actual number is estimated to be much, much higher, as much as 10 times higher. Um, so Lyme disease is um, spread by deer ticks. Uh, and the initial diagnosis is quite tricky. About 70% of people uh, get a, uh, like a bullseye skin rash. Um, but obviously a lot of people don't. Uh, and apart from this rash, uh, there's a number of different symptoms, but usually uh, diagnosis is limited to uh, antibody Western blots and more recently enzyme immunoassays, uh, which aren't particularly accurate and have led to a lot of uh, controversy about um, whether or not somebody actually has Lyme disease. Of course, there are all of these uh, broad symptoms that are common with many other infections and chronic inflammatory states. And so we're now again in the realm um, that uh, Amy touched on earlier. And in addition to this, you have post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, which is a, a description of what happens when people have what is theoretically a successful treatment, um, but they maintain a lot of these chronic, um, a lot of these chronic symptoms down the line. So Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia infection. Um, it's a spirochete. Uh, here you can see it's stained with Alexa floor, uh, 488, which makes it uh, easier to see its sort of uh, spirochetal cough through like uh, morphology. And if you put these bacteria in a dish with host neutrophils, these are human neutrophils, the neutrophils mount a fairly robust response and you can see them phagocytosing in these cells. Uh, and we call this the Lady in the Tramp movie because the cells uh, attack the spirochete from each end and are able to destroy it. However, in, v in vivo, um, there are a lot of pathways that lead to persistence of this infection. Um, and this is well described in a review from uh, Tracy and Bulmuth, uh, Bulmuth uh, from 2017, where you have things like tick delivery proteins, which suppress uh, host innate um, cell migration and activity. Um, there's in, uh, interference with adaptive immune responses, uh, a lot of different things, as well as uh, shape, they change shape into these uh, round body forms, which uh, seem to be more resistant. Um, and what I'll be talking to you mostly about today is um, the effects of complement inhibition and how this um, bacterium interacts with the complement system uh, in, uh, in human blood. So we were interested in looking at how consistent this spontaneous neutrophil migration score was relative to Lyme disease. Um, so we uh, recruited with um, John Brander, a small cohort of patients who were presenting with possible Lyme disease symptoms. So they essentially had a skin rash as well as some other secondary symptoms. Uh, you can see here, we didn't get that many with, um, with real, uh, you know, clinically confirmed Lyme, Lyme disease. And we had a lot of uh, ill controls with things like cellulitis, um, as well as fevers. And, um, and as you can see, you know, our, our spontaneous neutrophil uh, migration signature was very sensitive to infection, um, but not specifically, not very specific to uh, Lyme disease. So we kind of had an idea that it might be a useful diagnostic for this disease, um, but it turns out that, um, you know, this uh, neutrophil phenotype uh, is, is fairly broad. Uh, 
one thing that was pointed out to me uh, during a, a, a previous talk was that there's actually a, another species of Borrelia with an acute infection here and a very, very low spontaneous neutrophil migration uh, signature. And when I went back, it turned out that this um, patient was uh, acutely uh, neutropenic. So one of the downfalls of these um, drop of blood assays is if there's no neutrophils there to measure, you get a very low score. So if we stratify these patients according to their um, uh, disease, you see there looks like to be a trend of increased in this uh, neutrophil migration score. And specifically, if you look at the number of motile neutrophils, uh, it seems that in probable and possible Lyme disease, um, they do seem to be amplified. And this is at least significantly statistically, yeah, significantly statistic different to healthy controls. Um, we wanted to see whether we could uh, replicate this spontaneous migration signature by directly spiking uh, uh, Borrelia into whole blood. Uh, so we showed the uh, spontaneous neutrophil migration score here for controls, um, a positive control with C5A, which is the complement um, factor, uh, as well as a range of doses of Borrelia spiked into whole blood. And we get quite a variable response. Um, but we do get significant increases in neutrophil activation uh, with Borrelia, even at very low doses. Um, and this is mostly to do with the number of motel neutrophils and how far they migrate, uh, and some of them migrate back out of the, out of the maze. Um, one thing you might have caught on to was the fact that we're using a complement factor protein here as our positive control, and this also gives quite a variable um, neutrophil uh, response. Now, neutrophils and complement interact in a number of different ways. Um, and the complement pathway is, is a very, very old and uh, evolutionarily old and well-defined um, system. It's quite complex. There are, are three parallel pathways that can converge at various points. Um, and in interactions with neutrophils, there's a number of different ways that neutrophils can be primed, uh, can amplify and feedback the signal that they get from, um, from complement. And that's something I'll, I'll go into in more detail, as well as direct responses like degranulation and metosis. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, the main factor here in the interaction with neutrophils uh, for activation is uh, C5, which is cleaved to C5A. Uh, at the convergence of these pathways. Um, to look in more detail at how uh, C5, C5A might be involved in neutrophil responses um, to Borrelia in blood, uh, we went back to this assay that I described earlier for looking at uh, neutrophil bacteria uh, interactions. We made some modifications um, so that we could use uh, smaller volumes of blood in our assay. So, Usually, previously when we did this assay, we were isolating neutrophils from um, 10 mils of blood uh, and putting in isolated neutrophils. Uh, and this wasn't really conducive to, um, to taking patient samples. So we tried to move to a, a finger prick model where we use only 20 microliters of whole blood and we do a rapid red blood cell sedimentation step uh, to enrich for white blood cells, um, which we can then load into the outer loading chamber uh, of the assay. And so we have 33 of these chambers per condition that we're able to measure. And we increase the density of the cells by increasing the depth of the cha outer chamber. Uh, we then loaded the middle of these uh, chambers with fluorescently labeled um, Borrelia. And what we saw with control samples was quite a robust response of uh, neutrophils migrating in uh, to this chamber and uh, some phagocytosis and swarming around these, um, these Borrelia spirochetes. So to test what might be going on in terms of uh, complement activation in this assay, we used a couple of different uh, treatments. The first treatment was to heat treat the plasma, uh, which essentially abrogates all complement activity. We also did more specific targeting uh, of C3. Um, so avacapan um, inhibits cleavage of C3, and then eculizumab inhibits cleavage of uh, complement factor C5. So when we compare these conditions where we have plasma alone with Borrelia, heat-treated plasma 
uh, plasma with Borrelia, and then those pretreated with um, inhibitors of C3 and C5, um, what you see is robust recruitment of neutrophils in, the, uh, in response to Borrelia. This also occurred um, in, in the presence of C3 inhibitor, but it was uh, essentially com completely um, abrogated in the context of heat treated plasma or plasma uh, treated with the C5 uh, inhibitor. And corresponding to this lack of neutrophil recruitment, you see a decrease in the number of uh, acidified and phagocytosed um, Borrelia in these groups where you have uh, complement inhibition of C5. Now, what was kind of interesting is that um, when we went back to look at the spontaneous motility in the, in the context of uh, C5 inhibition, was that we saw reduced spontaneous neutrophil motility pretty much in every condition that we were able to stimulate it. And that includes after spiking with um, leukotriene B4, uh, the cleavage product of C5, C5A, uh, after we spiked with Borrelia. And this suggests that, um, that what we're inhibiting here is some kind of feedback loop because even if we uh, inject with enough of the, um, of the C5 cleavage product, C5A, we're still able to inhibit the spontaneous migration um, by reducing any further cleavage of C5. So this neutrophil activation seems to rely on a, on a, a positive feedback loop. And this is just more um, uh, evidence of this. So we can look at neutrophil chemotaxis towards C5A uh, in a, um, another microfluidic model. We have a C5A gradient coming from a, a chamber. And if we treat with pretty much any dose of um, uh, Ecolizumab here, we don't see any difference in the response to C5, uh, suggesting that um, what we're seeing is a, is a uh, result of a positive feedback loop. So um, in summary, uh, I hope I've shown some of the microfluidic assays that we think are useful for um, functional uh, analysis of host pathogen interactions and inflammatory states. Uh, for patients and a lot of these are geared towards drop of blood analysis of uh, neutrophil behavior and we use these assays to look at um, neutrophil activation during Lyme disease and directly study uh, neutrophil interactions with Borrelia and uh, we've, our main finding was that neutrophil responses seem to be mediated and amplified by activation of uh, complement factor 5. In terms of future directions for the lab uh, I'm quite interested in looking at more chronic states of and persistence of Borrelia, uh, and I'll be returning to the zebrafish model to look at the potential role for gr granuloma uh, in this um, in this context. And granuloma models in zebrafish have been used very effectively to study tuberculosis uh, in the past, and I hope this translates uh, to Lyme disease as well. Um, we have a grant to look at new tools for Borrelia immobilization. They're quite motile spirochetes. Uh, and also to look at in more detail at these neutrophil activation loops where you see a chain reaction of neutrophil activation um, uh, throughout the blood. And then we're also interested in looking at these initial interactions and the role of um, the innate uh, serum driven responses in determining what the final infection outcome is for these patients. You might've noticed that a lot of the responses we show uh, are all over the place and it's really due to donor donor variability and we wonder whether um, existing donor donor variability uh, plays a role in the outcome of, um, of uh, Borrelia infection and Lyme disease progression. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions.